I think the major issue that I want to tackle today is that I'm surrounded on one side by the anti-drone lobby, and I want everybody to understand that I'm all, all supportive of banning drone strikes. On the other side, I find myself surrounded a little bit by the Taliban and Al Qaeda, who think I'm making the drones that are firing the missiles. So, I need to tell you my story and also get some facts straight. But uh, you will agree that I feel a bit like the mosquito in the nudist colony. I don't quite know where to start. <laughs> Anyhow, let me begin. At the beginning, I was six or seven years old, holidaying with my family in Natya Gali in the hills. An uncle of mine came down, brought all of us boys these little plastic packets, which had a few scraps of wood in them, and you had printed instructions at the back. You could assemble these little pieces of wood into small gliders, and the instructions told you how to move the wings about so you could make the planes loop and roll and do various other things. I spent a week doing this kind of thing, but I was frankly a little bored. They should have flown longer. They should have flown higher. They should have flown faster. That wasn't happening. So I got my pen knife, hacked the little wooden glider, changed its shape. Did a lot of other funny things with it, and eventually the great test came when I launched it from a hill, and the glider disappeared. I think that's where my fascination for aircraft really started. I grew up, and my teenage years were spent getting very excited about model airplanes. When a lot of other teenage boys my age were getting excited about a lot of other things. So I noticed some of you looking a little strangely at me when I walked in, also. But I'll talk about that later. So there's nothing abnormal here, but I just want you to go through with me on my story. I kept working on model airplanes, and I carried this through into engineering college. Got a degree in mechanical engineering because there was no aerospace engineering available in Pakistan at the time. Did some research publications on model airplanes, which got me into MIT, which is this small liberal arts college somewhere in America. But uh, that changed my perspective about model airplanes. All of a sudden, I wanted to make unmanned aircraft, drones, not model airplanes anymore. I wanted to really do things which normal aircraft couldn't do. I came back to Pakistan, all idealistic with an aerospace engineering degree. Found that there were no aviation-related jobs available. The best I had a choice of was inspecting the welding on gas pipelines, or building agricultural tractors. Naturally, I took the more glamorous option, making tractors. I did this for four or five years, and decided to continue doing drone research in the meantime. I'll give you an. Interesting mix of ingredients that went into this drone research, but one of the major factors in doing anything in aerospace is funding. I had no money, so what I used to do was spend my weekends as a freelance photojournalist, trying to earn some extra bucks, which I could pump back into drone research, until someone told me that fashion photography paid better. So I became a fashion photographer, and you'd be. Pretty surprised to know this is the world first that I'm announcing over here for the first time, really. That the fashion industry in Pakistan was the first and the single largest contributor to Pakistan's first successful drone. <laughs> My career as a fashion photographer was destined to be pretty short-lived.、Uh, I did this for a few years. Until one of my fashion editors said that I made all the models look like drones. I didn't like that.、Uh, she could have said robotic, wooden-faced, but、uh, drones were always a sensitive topic as far as I was concerned. Then, from there onwards, the government noticed the fact that I had built a drone which could actually fly around on its own, on a pre-programmed set of points, send a video picture back to me while I was sitting in my drawing room, and come and land at my feet. There were people with vision even then, 
And one of them was Salim Mahmood, who was heading the Space and Upper Atmospheric Commission, SOPARCO. He got me in to start Pakistan's first official drone program. We were actually going to build unmanned aircraft. Uh, he didn't have a use in mind, neither did I. We thought that we would use them for surveillance purposes or atmospheric monitoring or do other fun things with them. But we weren't quite sure what we were going to do. Now remember, this was the era when we'd just done the nuclear explosion. We were subjected to all kinds of sanctions. And uh, I think one of the major factors that we had to then look at was the essential ingredients available to us then. And... Uh, Fashion models had funded the first drone. Then we needed to use microwave ovens, photocopiers, cars, CDs, and a whole bunch of other things, and I'll tell you why. When we needed to build our first radio transmitters and we needed microwave links, we pulled the magnetrons out of old microwave ovens. The stepper motors from old photocopiers became our antenna tracking systems. CDs were fashioned into the slip rings for our gyro-stabilized platforms. And car alternators charged the batteries on board our drones. We had a pretty good drone going, I can tell you that. Well, funding dried up, priorities changed. I picked up my briefcase one day and walked out of Saparco, back to my rooftop workshop in my parents' home, which was a 10 by 10 shed. Started trying to cut back on options and try and build better drones. The government noticed this again. Noticed us to the point that we had enough money to start a company. And at some point in time, we were even able to start building bigger drones, and we had a drone factory. So now we were building really serious machines, which could do a lot of things. Uh, again, I'd like to remind everyone, we were never asked to build armed drones, but these drones were primarily used for surveillance and civilian applications. Priorities changed again, the funding dried up again. I had a choice between selling the factory or sacking my entire team of young engineers. I decided to sell the factory, retain the team, put all our stuff in containers, moved into smaller premises. We posted everything that we had on a website and found that the world was interested in buying our drones from us. But then we had restrictions to face as far as the government of Pakistan was concerned. It took months to get export licensing. It took months to get any kind of permissions for training or testing. But you'd be surprised to know that drones now are being used to study tuna fish shoals in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. They're being used for search and rescue work for farmers stranded in the Australian outback. They're used to drop medicines to mountaineers stranded in ravines and valleys. They have mapped the ecosystem of the Amazon rainforest. And they have mapped the oceans of the world and Antarctica. Would you... <laughs> Would you believe that all those drones were made in Pakistan? <laughs> but let me digress here for a little bit, and you've heard enough talk about my glorious achievements and uh, how we managed to do these drones and export them out of the country, etc. There are a few questions that I'd like to answer and get some facts straight as far as drones are concerned before my time runs out. And one of the important questions is that are drones designed to be lethal? And let me correct that. Drones are not designed to be lethal. You can fit missiles to a passenger airliner and it becomes a fighter. You can string missiles to a drone, and it becomes a weapon of war. So why do you need drones at all? You need drones basically because they're there to do the quick and dirty jobs for you, where you cannot risk human life or a pilot measuring the radiation in Japan, or doing stuff like monitoring earthquakes or volcanoes. They're long endurance, they can stay in the air longer, and they're low cost. They're easy to produce, they don't require the infrastructure of an aircraft industry. So, saying no to drone strikes is something I strongly support. Saying no to drone technology is something that I do not support. It's a bit like saying no to a bus or a car, because somebody is going to fill it with explosives and ram it into a school or a home. I don't think you can say no to technology for this reason. Drones 
or machines do not have a conscience of their own. They're driven by their operators. So there are two things over here, which are both political and technical. And unlike popular assumption or Hollywood's best wishes, I've never heard of a case of a runaway drone with a mind of its own. It hasn't happened. Well, we started building smaller and smaller drones. And these drones were much smarter and usable for civilian applications. The one factor that is overriding is that none of the drones that we have manufactured and supplied to government R&D organizations or the Pakistan Armed Forces over the past 20 years is in actual operational use in Pakistan. They are in use in several other countries in the world. The question, I don't know why. The point that I want to make over here is that we are obsessed with only one type of drone in this country. The one that you see behind me on the screen is the predator. And another major issue as far as this is concerned is, why isn't anybody able to shoot this down? I've been asked this question many times. Again, the reasons are both political and technical. As far as the political reasons are concerned, I think all of you probably have this at the back of your minds because we don't want to. But I'll only address the technical part of this. Do we have the ability to do this? And you'll understand whether we have the ability to do this or not if I tell you that the Predator is something that flies around at 40,000 feet, is able to stay over something like the city of Karachi for 40 hours at a time. Your normal fighter, if it's scrambled to get a Predator down, has a mission time of roughly 20 minutes. The Predator can be in the area and gone before a fighter can go around looking for it. That's one of the reasons that it's technically difficult to shoot these drones down. But let's forget American drones for a while. Let's look at the fact, which is very little known to a lot of you in the audience and a lot of Pakistanis in general. We have a lot of drones making incursions from another neighboring country into Pakistan on a very regular basis, and nobody's shooting those down either. Is the decision still political and technical as far as that is concerned? I don't think so. What's the solution? The solution really is an anti-drone drone. Can it be built? Yes. Do we have the resources? No. Anyway, let's show you what can be built. And I'll just take a second and pull something out of the hat. Here's a little foam drone. It has a GPS satellite receiver. It has an electric motor. You launch it out. It flies around on a pre-programmed route for about 10 kilometers. It's got a whole bunch of very complicated electronics, which I don't understand myself. Has a video transmitter over here, has a camera at the bottom, and it can send you live video pictures, or it can send you any type of data that you want it to send back to you. It can be used for news gathering and for a whole bunch of diversified applications that can be put to use for civilian users. I wish we had a drone like this flying over PNS Mehran on Sunday evening. It would have saved a lot of lives. I have an interesting story to tell you about this drone. Dr. Alvi and I wanted to set up a live demonstration where we could be flying this drone from the cricket pitch outside and giving you a live video feed right here on the screen. When we talked to the management of the South End Club, and they said, OK, fine, you can do it. Just when we were set up to do all of this, they said, uh, could you please do this another time? Because the joggers might be disturbed. So I'm glad as a country we have our priorities correct. No to drones, yes to sports and fitness. <laughs> and <laughs> My vision for the future, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see more and more people involved in aerospace research. I'd like every engineering industry to turn into a teaching industry. About 10 years ago, I turned my company into de facto Aerospace Research Institute. I started hiring engineers fresh out of university. I started training them in drone and aerospace technologies. And in turn, these young men and women trained other engineers like them. I'm really proud of the fact that nearly every engineering institution in Pakistan now has an unmanned vehicle program or a drone development program where two or three batches of students are working for their final year thesis 
on these technologies. I'm also happy to say that nearly all these programs are supported by us. So, <laughs> so this is something which has been a very satisfying factor, despite the fact that there's been a lot of anti-drone propaganda around. I think the propaganda is primarily against drones being used as weapons of war, not drones being used to save lives. Among the things that we've been asked to do with this technology in the recent past are to build respirators using sensors from our flight control systems for medical patients. We've been asked to photograph flood rehabilitation work in Sindh and Balochistan. We have been asked to drop medicines using drones by doctors without borders in sub-Saharan Africa. In the future, my young engineers are already working on prototypes of a space drone, which could float around at altitudes of about 80,000 feet above the jet stream and take pictures, which could motivate faster flood relief and also allow us to monitor atmospheric changes which could lead to earthquakes and other major issues. I'd like to end really by saying that I don't think the day is very far when men of integrity once again will take decisions about Pakistan's future. I think they will need by their side these young engineers and scientists to run the hydroelectric projects, the dams, to plan irrigation and agriculture, to set up commerce and industry, and put electricity and alternate energy on the same page. Thank you for hearing me out. <laughs>